Hey, ladies and gentlemen, um, I thought I'd make a little cameo in class again. Hopefully this time we actually publish the video and you guys will have a chance to watch it. So you just finished a discussion about what makes you believe in something? Are you a person that ascribes more to logos or pathos or ethos? You appreciate it when someone just tells you what to do because they said so. Well, the fact of the matter is that when we're looking at the Bible, we incorporate logos, pathos, and ethos in regard to our beliefs. However, there's a lot of questions about why are the books that are in the Bible actually there in the Bible? Did they just end up there by chance? Did somebody in a stuffy old room with a big beard choose to put them there? Well, in fact, there are six different reasons that the books that are in the Bible actually appear in the Bible. And all of them are held to a very high standard of proof. So you don't just throw anything into the Bible and bang, we have Christianity or bang, we have Judaism. The fact of the matter is that they all went through various levels of like inscrutability and various levels of skepticism before they were actually placed in the Bible. So we're going to talk about those briefly just so you have them going into today because when we look at the miracles performed by Jesus, there's good questions around the fact of why were these miracles chosen? Why were these the Gospels that make up the Gospels of the New Testament? And hopefully we're going to be able to answer a couple of those questions. So first and foremost, a book is in the Bible if it was either written by an apostle or written by a prophet. So when we look in the Old Testament, we have a number of books written by the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Those are both cases in which the prophet actually wrote the book. So they were canonized based on the fact that they were written by men who were receiving the word from God, literally. Or a book is in the Bible because it was written by an apostle. We have this in a couple of different circumstances, uh, the letters from Peter, the letters from John, and also John's gospel, right? John was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He had a firsthand account, which some people would argue was actually direct evidence. So why are those books in the, the gospels, or excuse me, in the Bible? Because number one, they were either written by a prophet or by an apostle which is the first level of things that get you into the Bible. Next, ooh, next, there are the books that were written by people who were with a prophet or an apostle. So Moses writes the book of Genesis, right? But this is an accounting from God. In those circumstances, he was revealed the things that happened in Genesis and then thus was able to write them down. Therefore, Genesis is canonized. Additionally, when we look in the New Testament, we get things like the Gospel of Mark, right? Or the Gospel of Luke, including the book of Acts. These are people who were in close relationship with the prophets and the apostles. Mark was writing on behalf of Peter. Luke was doing research, traveling around with Paul. So the second thing that can get you a book in the Bible is that you are either with a prophet or an apostle. In those circumstances, you being with the prophet or apostle actually gets you into the Bible. Next, we have what is called truthfulness. Now, the level or the standard of truthfulness is actually pretty huge. So when they were debating about what scripture to actually put in the canon, they had to decide, well, is this scripture in fact truthful. And they actually had inquisitors, investigators, people looking into all of this, right? No one was going to just throw something in the Bible that wasn't consistent with everything else, which we'll talk about momentarily. So if there were facts that proved not to be truthful or were in question of being truthful, then they didn't make it into the Bible. That's why we have all these gospels like the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Mary Magdalene, that haven't been canonized because there are elements of them where the truth is questionable. So what's the third thing that gets you into the Bible? Yes, exactly, truthfulness, right? So as we move on from truthfulness, we move to consistency. So the Bible wasn't all just lumped together at one time, right? They didn't just have 70 some odd books that they were like, bam, this is the Bible. In fact, they actually made things scripture at different points in time. So what was required of any new book entering the Bible is that it needed to be consistent with the previous books that had been considered scripture already. So if they were saying something that was different than what had previously been 
said, then they couldn't be considered scripture. This is huge with Hebrews, right? We don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews. A lot of people believe that it was Paul. Other people believe that it was a pastor on the pulpit in Rome. But nonetheless, what we do know is that Hebrews actually consistently confirms a lot of what happened in the Old Testament. So we get consistency in Hebrews throughout Paul's epistles, but also throughout the New Testament and Old Testament. Therefore, what else gets you in the Bible, or what is the fourth qualification? Your writing has to be consistent with everything else that's already been considered Scripture. Therefore, consistency is a huge element of biblical canonization. From consistency, we move, move to what we refer to as confirmation. Anytime that Jesus confirms something is scripture, that makes it scripture. So why do Catholics accept all the books of the Old Testament? Because Jesus, in his preachings, accepted all the books of the Old Testament. So if Jesus said it's in, then it's in. And bam, we have what refer what is referred to as confirmation. Your scripture has been confirmed as scripture. This also happened with things in the New Testament when New Testament writers would refer to other pieces as scripture. So in the debate of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, Luke and Matthew theoretically pulled upon Mark in the writing of their gospels. Therefore, it legitimizes Mark in the process. And the last element is that Anything in the Bible needs to be in line with tradition. Remember, the Catholic Church is compiled of two things. It's tradition and it's scripture. This is really big because before we had scripture in some circumstances, we had tradition, right? The apostles were doing things in Jerusalem. Paul was doing things throughout Asia Minor and Europe. And this is important mainly because if it aligned with the tradition and it was written down, then it could potentially be canonized. However, if it didn't align with what they were doing, then we can't canonize it because we know that the apostles were doing what they were doing for a reason. So the last qualification of scripture is that it is in line with the traditions of the church. Does the writing match what the church was previously doing? Now, I tell you all of this mainly because it's important for you to know that the books of the Bible are there for a reason, right? They have gone under scrutinous examination, right? They have been questioned. They have been held against trials and tribulations. And the fact of the matter is that the books that you have are the books that are supposed to be there. They are the inspired components of Scripture. So as you delve into Scripture today, know that everything that you are reading has undergone this process and is consistent with these six elements of what makes scripture, scripture. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Be good for the subs.